Now our next speaker is not only a very successful businessman, he also truly exemplifies the entrepreneurial spirit, spirit to which we all aspire. Manuel D. Medina is the founder, chairman, and CEO of Terramark Worldwide, a publicly traded company. Mr. Medina was born in Matanzas, Cuba in 1952, immigrating to the United States with his family in 1965. After graduating from Miami Beach High School, he enrolled at Miami-Dade College and then Florida Atlantic University, where he received a Bachelor of Science degree in accounting in 1974. In 1980, he founded Terramark and has since led the company, company successfully as its chairman and CEO. In 2001, Florida Governor Jeb Bush appointed Mr. Medina to the Board of Directors of IT Florida. Comprised of industry leaders from all the major technology sectors of the state, IT Florida provides guidance to the governor, legislature, and other policymakers on technology issues. Mr. Medina was the first chairman of Florida's Digital Divide Council, which addresses the importance to all Floridians of access to information technology and training in its use. Active in community life as well as professionally, Mr. Medina has received numerous awards, including the 2004 Ultimate CEO Award presented by the South Florida Business Journal, the Entrepreneur of the Year Award from the South Florida Hispanic Chamber of Commerce and South Florida Entrepreneur of the Year Award from the Florida International University of College Business Administration. Terramark has also won wide recognition that includes being named one of the top 250 public companies in Florida by Florida Trend and by the South Florida Business Journal. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming distinguished Florida Atlantic University alumnus, Dr. Manuel Medina. It's a real pleasure for me to uh, be here today. And uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on my background because I think you can, uh, there's a certain thing today called Google. You can go ahead and Google up. But yes, I did arrive here in 1965 as a refugee on a boat with my family. And yes, it was a very tumultuous time in 1965 in Miami. If uh, all those of you who are my age or older remember the civil rights, the Cubans were about uh, to become uh, numerous. Uh, the Puerto Ricans were afraid, the whites were being displaced. And Miami in 1965 was uh, just maybe a notch above Vietnam. It was a very difficult time for a 13-year-old boy to be growing up in, an, uh, in, a, in a place like this. My mother, a uh, year after uh, we arrived, wanted to go, literally go back to Cuba because uh, I got into a lot of trouble. Um, almost became a high school dropout. Luckily, because she is the only person in the world that I've ever been afraid of, uh, she actually uh, made me make it through high school. And then just to prove to her that I wasn't going to like college, I went to Miami Dade, which was a wonderful experience for me, and totally transformed my life. Miami Dade, for those of you who know me, know that I've spent a lot of time. And one of the highlights of my career was when I became a trustee of Miami Dade, because I really owe them. From Miami Dade, when I got a totally switched my life from jail and fights to uh, education, I discovered FAU which of course was a home, and at that time, FAU, uh, I think we were four or 5,000 students. Uh, the dorms had different names. Uh, there were plenty of owls. Uh, the chief of police was fat, and we used to call him hippo trouble. Uh, so basically, uh, it was a totally different kind of FAU at the time. But given that we were so poor, you know, I stayed on campus on the weekends, probably maybe me and about 40 other kids. So FAU was a great time in my life, because it actually taught me a lot about myself. So from there, I went on, uh, became a CPA. I'm a, I like to consider myself a reformed CPA because I am definitely not an accountant by devotion. Not that there's anything wrong with it. But from there, after a very brief career with Pricewaterhouse, I really went out on my own and sought my own uh, 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 endeavors into creating Terramark. And today, I assure you that all of you have done business with us. If any of you use email, if any of you Google up your friends or instant message your friends, or you know, et cetera, you are doing business with us because that's what we do. We basically take the traffic of the internet, much like we take the traffic, of, much like an airport takes the traffic of uh, passengers and we exchange bits. And upon that, actually, we have one network communicating with another and that's what we do worldwide. It's a publicly traded company which today has a totally new set of circumstances that we have to deal with under Sarbanes-Oxley and a number of other things. So that's enough for, of my background. What I've done through the past, when I particularly I love to talk to kids, and, 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 and when I, I don't mean that you're kids, but young people, and I like to talk to even kids that are a lot younger because they're all like a sponge, you know. 
and, and all these principles of passion and all these principles, of course, they're all true. What happens is they ask me, how do you do it? I mean, okay, I understand you got to have passion. Let's assume you're not born with passion. You know, I understand you got to do, how do you actually break the principles that actually make you successful in life, assuming that successful is measured in the sense of achievement, whether financially or uh, from a point of view of professional. So what I've done through the years uh, is I've, I've broken down to seven, what I call my seven keeps. And none of them are in particular order, but basically is uh, my first keep is as you start out in life, the first thing you need to do is set your reputation. In order for you to set your reputation, the most important thing that you can do is keep your word. Now I know that sounds easy, I keep my word, but it is not. It is very difficult. There are many times when you give your word and then all of a sudden for whatever reason, circumstances change and you don't want to do what you gave your word about. Well, let me tell you something. If you keep your word, even if it costs you money, if it costs you heartaches, then what happens is that your reputation begins to build. In my personal life, my business life, keeping my word has been helpful to me a million times. And I, very early on, my grandfather taught me, and I always thanked him for that. I didn't know what he meant then, but I can tell you sitting here today that, that I always do that as my number one principle, because if you build your reputation, everything else will follow. Now, I like to give examples of how this helps, and I have a million examples of how keeping my word actually has helped me through my life. One of the most uh, funny ones is the fact that uh, I like animals, I love dogs, but I don't particularly like cats. And anybody who knows me knows that cats and I don't get along, don't trust them, whatever, etc. Anyways, in the time that Terry Mark was in the development business, of course, all of you who know how to develop, I think Gino, your father, you told me he's in the uh, development business. You know, it's a very high motive, a very, very, very high octane, uh, high risk, high reward business. And there was an office tower, actually where our offices are today, that we built in Coconut Grove. When we had bought the uh, existing buildings there, we had just totally sold everything in it and we were about to demolish the buildings. Now we had a loan closed, we were paying interest, and this is very significant amounts of money. The tower was about 300,000 square feet, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We're about to pull the trigger on demolishing the buildings and I get a call from a reporter. Now, let me put the uh, scenario. At the time, I was the most hated person in Coconut Grove because I had developed Monty's, I had developed Coco Walk, I had developed a number of projects, and the, Co the Groveites thought at the time that I was the devil incarnate because I was a developer. And therefore, you know, they all hated me. So all of a sudden, this reporter calls me one day and says, what are you going to do about the cats? And I said, what cats? He says, well, there's a whole colony of cats that are just living. Oh, yeah, yeah, those cats, of course. I know that colony of cats. And we're going to rescue each one of them. Do you have your word that you're going to rescue all the cats? And I said, yes, you have my word that I will rescue the cats before I put the bulldozer and do anything in there at the cost of hundreds of thousands of dollars. And I told the reporter I would do it. Now, my board, my partners thought that I was insane. We ended up finding a cat trapper. We ended up renting three apartments, filling it up with hundreds of cats, neutering the males, spaying the females, adopting program, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Anyways, I kept my word at a great, let me tell you, that was a turning point. And not only did Coconut Grove favor everything else that we did since, but what it happened was it changed the image of us as a company. Now obviously you did it because it was good for business, but you also did it because you, I gave my word and that will happen time and time again. The second keep that I always talk about is keep fit. So on bite sizes, right? It sounds simple. I think keeping fit is incredibly important. I, for me, consider exercise no different than eating, drinking, or sleeping. I believe exercise is an integral part of my life. I'm a black belt in Kung Fu. I believe in training my in side as well as my outside, I meditate, I breathe, and I actually learned that the she that is inside of you is something that helps you actually calm yourself down or actually be very, very powerful when you need it. So exercise doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be a uh, marathon runner, but exercise and keeping fit for me is a very integral part of my life. The third part of uh, my keeps so or the third keep is keep learning. Don't ever stop learning. A few years ago, I was asked to give the commencement address of the graduating class of uh, School of Engineering at the University of Miami. 
And I, uh, there were all 600 kids, oh, you know, may I have my regalia? And all the kids, they are, of course, they're all graduating, and they are looking for me to give them this great words of wisdom. And I start out by saying, you know what? You already made your first mistake. You become engineers. <laughs> so, now, obviously, they didn't know where I was going with that. So there was a little bit of trepidation at the beginning. But what I meant and the whole gist of my, and believe me, we now employ hundreds of engineers. Most of our employees are very, very big engineers. But what I, what I meant to tell them was, keep learning. Don't become focused in your career to the point of everything else. I devour. I read the back of the cereal box. I mean, I read everything that I can get my hands on. I like to read about stuff that is maybe a lot of useless information. I love Jeopardy. I love, I love that knowledge of everything around me not just about the business world. Yeah, I read the Wall Street journals and I like to keep myself abreast in the business world, but I love everything about life, whatever it is, conflicts, politics, and I, I encourage you as my third keep is to keep learning. My fourth keep is a very important one, is to keep a sense of humor. I believe that if you have a sense of humor, life will be very kind to you because basically you're able particularly to laugh at yourself. I seen it time and time again where a sense of humor gets me out of trouble or particularly gets me into a situation where people want to be with somebody who has a sense of humor. You don't want to be with somebody who has a somber big face. I was, uh, we have a big project now that we're building in Culpeper, Virginia. Uh, huge uh, uh, development of uh, one of our uh, uh, hubs. Now Culpeper is about 60 miles from uh, Washington DC. It's gentleman's farmer. To give you an idea, the property that we bought, the 30 acres that we bought, the family's been there since the early 1700s. Now, as I went the other three weeks ago to announce the project, Governor Keynes from Virginia came to Culpeper, and it was a big deal. Every farmer from within the radius of 20 miles came, every commissioner, city, everybody that was there, because here's this new company coming to Culpeper, which is really, really a, you know, kind of a country society, to put it mildly. Uh, and all of a sudden they had heard about me, a Cuban-American, you know, and who the hell is this guy and coming to Culpeper? And there was this tremendous amount of apprehension because they had somebody who was foreign coming to their, to their backyard. Now they all want us and they want the project, but there was a tremendous amount of apprehension. So I get up there and I said, you know, I am thrilled to be in Culpeper. I'm, you know, glad to be here, but I'm very disappointed at the efficiency of the local government. And everybody's looking at me like, what? I said, yes, I specifically asked you for a microphone without a Spanish accent. <laughs> well, guess what? That's what happened. They all broke, you know, and from then on, they're my buddies, you know. It was all great, and I'm just another one of them, and I wear my cowboy hats and boots, and just, I'm just another one of them. Maybe I speak a little bit funnier, but you know what? That really doesn't matter. So that keeping a sense of humor is something that is incredibly important. On my fifth uh, keep is keep humble. Uh, particularly for all of you young studs, Gino, Austin, you know, all of you, you believe that the world actually is at your doors. There's nothing you can do wrong. You did a great event here tonight, so the next event is going to be better, and there's no stopping you, right? Well, let me tell you something. Life will stop you. And you are going to be hit with a two by four in the back of the head the moment that you least expect. So keep humble and thankful and grateful for what you've got and for, for what has been given to you. I give thanks every day. Because I really, it happened to me once in my life. I was living in Star Island. My next door neighbor was Gloria and Emilio Stefan, good friends. And I had my yacht in the back and I was f flying. And man, I tell you, I just, <laughs> there was nothing Manny Medina could do wrong. <laughs> Guess what? All of a sudden, in one of our developments, the big tenant went bankrupt. Uh, the company got indicted. Uh, not our company, but their company got indicted, etc. Cetera, et cetera. All of a sudden, my world came crumbling down. At the end of the day, it was the best thing that ever happened to me because basically it kept me, a principle that I've always believed in is it kept me humble again. And today, I don't care what happens in my life. I don't care whether I'm here, privileged as I am today, talking to all these young, eager kids and uh, distinguished uh, other invitees. Uh, humility is something that will always be with me. The sixth is probably the most difficult keep, and that is keep your faith. Faith is a great gift. I don't mean religion, I mean faith. Now, if it happens that faith and religion coincides and you're a member of a structured religion, then that's fine as well. I don't care what religion it is. But faith 
in that whatever is happening to you at the time that is happening needs to be happening. It's a big statement. And basically, particularly when things go wrong, why did this happen? Why didn't I get this job offer? Why did I get fired? Why did my girlfriend break up? You know, why did my car break down? Why did I get a ticket? Why, why am I sick? You know, why, why? So what is the justice in this? Why do kids, you know, and that is something that is probably the most difficult thing that I've had to learn through the years is that that faith is an integral part of living and that what needs to happen to you is happening right now, right this second. Tony Stromberg said something before about success being a goal with a deadline. The ultimate deadline is death. Imagine what life would be if you didn't know you were going to die or there is no death. What would you do? What would be your motivation for you to get up in the morning and say, I really need to cram up and do like Austin does and make 36 hours out of 24 hours if you didn't have that ultimate motivation and that ultimate deadline? So faith is something that I think you, it takes time, but I think all of you have experienced already. Something happened to you that was terrible, and then later on you say, my God, this really was the best thing that happened to me. So keeping that faith is something that is incredibly important and incredibly difficult. The last keep is keep trying. You hear that all the time. It's, you know, it's a rhetoric. It's, you know, you keep trying, you persevere, you go on, you know, don't let people tell you that you don't want to do it, I mean, that you can't do it. I mean, uh, we heard the story again of Gino, and all of you know the stories of people such as myself that was, people ask me when, when the Napoli Americans in Turmark, they say, how did you do it? And I said, because I was so stupid, I didn't know I couldn't do it. If I would have known I could do it, then I would have never been able to do it. So you hear this all the time. Keep trying, keep trying. Well, guess what? It's true. The problem is that it's very difficult. If you, in order for you to try, in order for you to define the word trying, means you have to give up. There are consequences, and there's a very big price to pay. Do you want to be a successful entrepreneur? You want to work 24 hours? You want to give up birthdays, Valentines? You want to give up you know, communions and anything that is important at the expense of making your passion the number one priority, that is trying. Trying meaning is that you have an alternative today and I say, well, I got to go to my kid's fifth birthday or I have these bankers coming from, you know, uh, New York and I have to make a decision. Trying means that you actually have this gut fear that you actually know that the consequences of you failing are very severe. I've had it a number of times. I don't know how I've stood in front of people and said, are we gonna get paid on Friday? And I've said, who even thought about the idea of not getting paid and me not knowing, having the slightest clue where the money was gonna come from. That is trying. It's having that gut feeling and that what you're doing is right, that it's gonna be right, that it's going to be okay because your faith keeps you going. Your faith, that day that you had a bad day, all you have to do is make it through that bad day and then you'll make it the next day. And then that faith keeps you going and you know you're going to try, you know you're going to give up certain things in life that your friends will say, well, look at such and such, you know, they basically, uh, you know, I cannot go and coach, uh, you know, the football or the baseball team for the kids and every other, well, then you got to make your priorities right. I'm not saying that co coaching the kids' football team is a bad thing, on the contrary, but you cannot be coaching your kids' football team and be a very successful entrepreneur, I promise you that. So you keep trying, you actually then compromise as to what it is that you actually decide that is important to you in your own life. In my case, I never had the choice, because in my case, I absolutely love what I do. I love the challenge. I am a masochist born I have to get in trouble. When everything is going right, I have to go and invent something else, you know, and I have to get bigger, and you know, because that's really what drives me. I'm not a serial entrepreneur, but I am a serial given of a given challenge and taking it to, the, uh, to its culmination. That's it, those are my seven keeps. I uh, hope that you've enjoyed them, and I hope that, uh, you know, I come here, my boss, uh, Pat, uh, you know, says to uh, come up and talk to the kids. I'm very happy to talk to you, and I'm very happy to uh, have been here today, thanks. Thank you very much, 
Dr. Medina, and we'd like to uh, present this to you. Thank you for inspiring the leaders of tomorrow today. Thank you very much. Thank you. You know, it's, it, it's interesting. There's a, there's a thread, a common thread that's woven between all of our speakers thus far. It's passion, it's success, and now it's humility. File those away. Jim Collins, in his book, Good to Great, mentions three things that make a great entrepreneur, a, a truly successful entre entrepreneur. Number one, they're passionate about what they do. Number two, they have a bottom line mentality. They want to succeed, and they're passionate about succeeding. And number three, and interestingly enough, they're devoid of self-ego. They have an ego, but that ego is satisfied by the success of their company, by the success of what they've done. And they really don't need to be throwing their chest out. It's an interesting observation because passion has been woven throughout all of our speakers' uh, talks today. And that's, uh, as has success and now humility. So file those away.